The Battle of War, 29 January, the 4th of February 1943, was a battle in the New Guinea campaign of World War II. Forces of the Empire of Japan sailed from Rabaul and crossed the Solomon Sea and, despite Allied air attacks, successfully reached Leh, where they disembarked. Japanese troops then advanced overland on war, an Australian base that potentially threatened the Japanese positions at Salamua and Leh. A race developed between the Japanese moving overland, hampered by the terrain, and the Australians, moving by air, hampered by the weather. By the time the Japanese reached the war area after a trek over the mountains, the Australian defenders had been greatly reinforced by air. In the battle that followed, despite achieving tactical surprise by approaching from an unexpected direction, the Japanese attackers were unable to capture war. Chapter 1 Background Chapter 1 Section 1 Geography War is a town in New Guinea, in the province of Marobe situated at one end of the War Bololo Valley. It was the site of a gold rush during the 1920s and 1930s. Gold prospectors arrived at the coast at Salamua and struggled inland along the Black Cat Track. The miners partially cleared the area and built houses and workshops, and established a water supply, and an electricity grid. They constructed the aerodromes at War and Bololo which were the primary means of reaching the War Bololo Valley. War Aerodrome was a rough kunai grass airstrip 3,100 feet in length with a 10% slope heading directly for Mount Kandy. Aircraft could approach from the northeast only, landing uphill and taking off downhill. The mountain at the end of the runway prevented second attempts at landing and precluded extension of the strip. Pilots had to maneuver Dakotas under clouds and through dangerous passes, dodging a peak here and cloud there, landing at high speeds. This required good visibility, but the weather over Owen Stanley Range was characterized by frequent storms, vertical drafts, and mists which rose from the jungle floor. The first landing of war, was made by Ernest Mustard in his de Havilland DH.37 on the 19th of April 1927. Osmar White, who reached war in June 1942, wrote. Were towns built sole by virtue of man's conquest of the air? Every nail, sheet of iron, weatherboard, spot of paint, pane of glass, crock, wire or sheet of paper was carried in by air at freight rates between 4d and 1-5d per pound. The wrecked trucks that now dotted the highways, rusted out and twisted by fire, were brought in by air. The billiard tables at the hotels were brought in by air. Easy chairs, refrigerators, bathtubs, stoves, dynamos, linoleum, carpets, garden statuary, even great mining dredges, bulldozers and power shovels, all were brought in by air, and this in a decade when most people in Australia were still thinking it adventurous to take a five-minute joy ride over an airfield. Chapter 1 Section 2 Kanga Force After the war with Japan began, War became an evacuation center, receiving refugees from Leh and Salamua. Non-native women and children were evacuated while men of military age were called up for service in the New Guinea Volunteer Rifles, the local militia unit. Initially, civilians were evacuated by civilian aircraft, but as the Japanese drew closer, bombing war on 23 January 1942, it became too dangerous to fly without fighter escort, which was unavailable. This left some 250 European and Asian men stranded. These refugees made a hazardous journey over the Owen Stanley Range on foot by way of Kujero and Tekadu to Bulldog, a disused mining settlement where there was an aerodrome, and thence down the Lake Kamu River to the sea. Dot with the feasibility of the route thus demonstrated, New Guinea Force decided to establish a line of communications to war via the Bulldog Track. A platoon of the 1st Independent Company left Port Moresby in the schooner Royal Endeavour and traversed the route, joining the men of the New Guinea Volunteer Rifles holding the war area. This was the beginning of what became Kanga Force on 23 April 1942. On of May, the 21st Troop Carrier Squadron Asaf flew in commandos of the 2 Independent Company to join Kanga Force. 
The two sevenths independent company followed in October 1942. Supplies could be flown into war if fighter cover was available. On 5 September, 12 plane loads of supplies were dropped at Kujeru. To economize on scarce transport aircraft, air transport was supplemented by an overland route. Supplies were shipped to the mouth of the Lake Kamu in luggers, transported up the river to Bulldog in launches or powered dugout canoes, and then carried over the Bulldog track by native carriers. Chapter 1 Section 3 – Strategy Kanga Force achieved one notable success, in a raid on Salamua in June 1942, but apart from that they had done little to harass the Japanese at their Salamua and lay bases. They had however managed to threaten the Japanese without provoking them into an offensive against war at a time when the Allies did not have the resources to reinforce Kanga force, and they had provided valuable information. War occupied an important place in the strategy of the commander, Allied Land Forces, Southwest Pacific Area, General Sir Thomas Blamey, who was concurrently commanding New Guinea Force, from Port Moresby. At the time, the Japanese held air superiority over the Solomon Sea, precluding airborne or seaborne operations against the Japanese base at Ley. Blamey therefore decided that he would have to capture Ley with a land campaign. The Bulldog track would be upgraded to a highway capable of carrying trucks and tanks that could support a division that would advance overland on Ley. Lieutenant General Hitoshi Imamura, the commander of the Japanese 8th Area Army at Rabaul, correctly deduced his opponent's intentions and the strength of Kanga force and resolved to head off the danger to lay. He ordered Lt. Gen. Hatazo Adichie's 18th Army to secure important areas to the west of Ley and Salamua. On 29 December 1942, Adichie ordered the 102nd Infantry Regiment, and other units under the command of Major Gen. Toru Okabe, the commander of the infantry group of the 51st Division, to move from Rabaul to Ley and then immediately advance inland to capture war. Okabe's force was known as the Okabe Detachment. Imamura was up against a resourceful, resolute and aggressive opponent, who also had access to good intelligence. Allied Ultra Codebreakers were reading the Japanese shipping codes, and, by 3 January 1943, Allied commanders knew in advance about the force that Adichie was planning to send from Rabaul to Ley, although they did not know the force's ultimate destination. Blamey chose not to wait for this to become clear, but immediately ordered the 17th Infantry Brigade to move from Milne Bay to war on 4 January 1943. Its commander, Brigadier Murray Moton, was ordered to assume command of Kanga force and defend war. Chapter 2 – Prelude the commander, Allied Air Forces, Southwest Pacific Area, Lieutenant General George Kenny, ordered his bomber commander, Brigadier General Kenneth Walker, to carry out a full-scale dawn bombing attack on the shipping in Rabaul Harbor before it could depart. Walker demurred, his bombers would have difficulty making their rendezvous if they had to leave Port Moresby at night. He recommended a noon attack instead. Kenny acknowledged Walker's concerns but was insistent, he preferred bombers out of formation to bombers shot down by the enemy fighters that were sure to intercept a daylight attack. Inclement weather precluded participation by bombers from Australia, so all that was available were the aircraft on hand in Papua, 6B-17s and 6B-24s. In spite of Kenny's orders, Walker attacked Rabaul Harbour at noon on 5 January, and encountered heavy flak and continuous fighter attacks. 4,500 pounds and 24 1,000 pounds bombs were dropped from 8,500 feet. The formation claimed hits on nine ships, totaling 50,000 tons. Two B-17s were shot down, including the one carrying Walker, who was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. After the war, Dinak confirmed the sinking of only one Japanese merchant ship, the 5,833-ton Kifuku Maru. Two other ships were damaged, as was the destroyer Tashikaze. On 6 January, the Japanese convoy carrying Okabe's force set out for Ley from Rabaul. Forewarned by Ultra, a SAF and RAF aircraft spotted, shadowed and attacked the convoy, which was shielded by low clouds and Japanese fighters. 
The Allies claimed to have shot down 69 Japanese aircraft for the loss of 10 of their own. A P-38 pilot, First Lieutenant Richard Bong claimed three, becoming an ace. A RAF Catalina of No. 11 Squadron RAF under the command of Flight Lieutenant David Vernon, made a night bombing attack on the convoy which sank the transport Nishu Maru. Destroyers rescued 739 of the 1,100 troops on board, but the ship took with it all of Okabe's medical supplies. Another transport, Miyoko Maru, was so badly damaged at lay by Asaf B-25s that it had to be beached. Nonetheless, the convoy succeeded in reaching Leh on 7 January and landing about 4,000 troops. In all, the Allied Air Forces flew 416 sorties. Between 10 and 16 January, the Akabe detachment moved down the coast in barges to Salamua, where it assembled and completed its preparations for the attack on war. On 16 January, the Japanese encountered a platoon of the 2 7ths Independent Company under Captain Geoffrey Bowen. A brief action followed in which Bowen was killed, and the Australians retreated back to Skindwai. However, instead of pursuing them, Okabe chose to advance on war down an old and seldom used track running through difficult country parallel to the Black Cat track, and the two sides lost contact. Okabe thereby disguised the strength and objective of his force, and took the Australians by surprise. It was necessary to cross Komaitam Hill, advance to Mubo, and then take the track westward. This route was chosen so as to avoid observation from Allied aircraft in the daytime as they cut their way into the jungle. The mountain range east of War was about 1,500 feet high and not particularly difficult to cross, but in parts there were no tracks. These had to be prepared without being spotted by the Allied aircraft. As the troops had to carry their food, ammunition and equipment on their backs, the advance was difficult and took longer than anticipated. Eventually they reached a peak from which they were able to look down on the Warbololo Valley. By this time, food was running short. The commander of the Okabe detachment, pointing at the war village, gave the order to attack, we are short of food, let us quickly capture war and get food from the enemy. However, the movement through such dense jungle caused his units to lose touch with each other. The resulting attack was delivered piecemeal, without sufficient preparation. Meanwhile, the 1st Group of the 17th Infantry Brigade, the 2 6th Infantry Battalion, had embarked for Port Moresby on 9 January 1943. The rest of the battalion followed over the next two nights. The 2 7th Infantry Battalion departed Milne, Bay on the Army Transport to Runa on 13 January and the 2 5ths on Duntroon the next day. The prospects of beating the Japanese to war did not look good. At this time, there were only 28 Dakotas in New Guinea, in three understrength squadrons, the 6th, 21st and 33rd Troop Carrier Squadrons of the U.S. 374th Troop Carrier Group. These had to be shared with the Boonagona Front, so each combat area had 14 planes allocated to it, which worked out to 10 aircraft available per day for each. A Dakota could carry 27 passengers or 10,000 pounds of freight. Moving an infantry battalion required 60 plane loads, moving a brigade group required 361 plane loads. Between 10 and 19 January, the 2 6th Infantry Battalion was flown in from Port Moresby to reinforce Kanga Force. In the process, there were three crashes. Poor flying weather forced many aircraft to return without landing. Brigadier Moton was twice forced to return to Port Moresby before reaching war on the third attempt. Bad weather continued over the following week, limiting air operations and sometimes precluding them entirely. Part of the 2 5th Infantry Battalion arrived on 27 January. Chapter 3 Rattle Standing in the way of Okabe's advance was a company of the 2 6th Infantry Battalion under Captain W. H. Sherlock. Okabe ordered an all-out attack on Sherlock's position on 28 January. Sherlock was forced from his position and retreated onto a nearby spur. 
For much of the afternoon, frontal Japanese attacks were repelled by Australian mortar and machine gun fire, and efforts to infiltrate Sherlock's positions were defeated by a bayonet attack led by Sherlock in person. By 1800 hours, Sherlock's mortar ammunition had run out and his small arms ammunition was running short, while his position was being plastered with mortar rounds and swept by machine gun fire. Sherlock held on through the night and was killed the next day trying to break through the Japanese lines. For his actions, Sherlock was posthumously mentioned in dispatches. The fighting at Buna ended on the 23rd of January, freeing up aircraft to support war, and 52 brand new Dakotas of the US 317th Troop Carrier Group had arrived in Australia, their movement from the United States having been expedited in response to urgent requests from General Douglas MacArthur arising from the Boona fighting. After a quick maintenance check, they were flown up to Port Moresby to help the 374th Troop Carrier Group fly the 17th Infantry Brigade into war. This meant that up to 40 aircraft were now available daily. On 29 January, 57 planeloads arrived, bringing most of the 2 7th Infantry Battalion, and the remainder of the 2 5ths. Although subjected to small arms fire as they came in and unloaded, 40 aircraft made 66 trips the next day. Their cargo included two dismantled 25 pounder guns of the 2 over 1 Field Regiment with 688 rounds of ammunition under the command of Captain R. J. Wise. These were landed in the morning and in action before noon, shelling a concentration of 300 enemy troops between the villages of Wandumi and Kaznik. The Japanese were also engaged by both fighters of No. 30 Squadron RAF flying close air support. Three Dakotas were damaged when one overshot the runway on landing and crashed into two others. One was repaired, but the other two were a total loss. One of the 46th Troop Carrier Squadron's pilots, Staff Sergeant William B. Teague was injured, losing a leg. Japanese attacks that day succeeded in reaching the corner of the airstrip but were forced to fall back under enormous pressure. On 31 January, 35 aircraft made 71 trips, and 40 aircraft made 53 trips on 1 February, bringing reinforcements including the two-thirds independent company that brought the strength of Kanga force to over 3,000 men. This included a company of machine guns from the 7th Machine Gun Battalion that had been flown in to defend the airfield. By the 4th of February, Okabe was threatened with encirclement, and was forced to order a withdrawal. With all hope of capturing war gone, Okabe was ordered to abandon the attempt. For his high order of leadership and control at war, Moton was awarded a bar to his distinguished service order. The Japanese attempted to cut off the stream of Allied transports by bombing the war airstrip, but it was the rainy season and they were confronted by the same weather conditions which hampered the Allies. Aircraft which did set off from Rabaul were not able to sight the war airstrip and returned without accomplishing anything. Not until 6 February, was there an aerial engagement. Eight P-39s of the 40th Fighter Squadron were patrolling at 12,000 feet over war, having provided escort for a flight of five Dakotas, when they sighted 24 Japanese planes. Captain Thomas H. Winburn led his P-39s in an attack, claiming 11 Mitsubishi A6M0s and Mitsubishi Ki-21 Sallies shot down. Meanwhile, Eight P-40s of the 7th Fighter Squadron also on an escort mission sighted 12 aircraft bombing the airstrip at war. The transports they were escorting turned back while the fighters engaged the Japanese, claiming seven aircraft shot down. At this time, there were four Dakotas on the ground at war and another five were circling, waiting to land. One Dakota, commanded by 2nd Lieutenant Robert M. Schwensin, was shot down. All five crewmen on board were killed. A Dakota on the ground was damaged, and a CAC Wiraway was destroyed by a bomb blast. Its two-man crew had hurriedly left the aircraft seconds before and thrown themselves flat on the ground. The pilot, Flight Sergeant A. Rodburn, was unharmed, but the observer, Sergeant A. E. Cole, was hit in the shoulder by shrapnel. 
The air cooperation signals hut took a direct hit and three men were killed. Major General Ennis Whitehead's advanced echelon headquarters in Port Moresby ordered three squadrons based there to join the battle. P-38s of the 39th Fighter Squadron engaged a dozen Japanese fighters over war, shooting one down. A few minutes later, the 9th Fighter Squadron, which had only recently converted to the P-38, downed another Japanese fighter, while P-40s of the 41st Fighter Squadron surprised six Japanese fighters, shooting down three. The airmen claimed to have shot down 23 Japanese fighters and a bomber. Australian gunners of the 156th Light Anti-Aircraft Battery claimed another bomber and two fighters. For its part in the battle, the 374th Troop Carrier Group was awarded a Distinguished Unit Citation. Chapter 4 Aftermath From its creation in May 1942 until 15 February 1943, Kanga Force lost 30 officers and 319 men, including four officers and 48 men of the 26th Infantry Battalion. The Australians counted 753 Japanese dead. Adding 361 lost on Nishu Maru and numerous airmen puts the number of Japanese deaths at around 1,200. While New Guinea force wished to pursue the Japanese, logistical difficulties precluded this. The Japanese prepared to make another attempt to capture war. This time, the plan was to approach from the north, building a road from Markham Point to the Snake River Valley. From there the advance would have headed down the valley to war. The 51st Division was earmarked for the mission, but it suffered heavy losses en route to New Guinea in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. This impressed the Japanese command with the dangers from Allied air power. A new plan was therefore devised under which a land line of communication was to be established running down the Ramo and Markham valleys. In June, Adachi was ordered to prepare to capture war. Road construction was carried out at great hardship to the troops involved, but the road was still incomplete when the Allied landings at Nadzab and Ley caused work to be suspended. For the Allies, war became an important jumping-off point for the Salamua-Ley campaign.